This is a 2005 ZX-10 and I picked it up to uh, do track days with it because that's what it's made for. Uh, I, was, I started doing track days on a ZRX-1200 and uh, here's a picture of that. And that was, uh, you can do them on kind of most bikes, but the bikes that are really not made for that, you have to work around what they can't do. So later on, I sold the ZRX and I bought the Ninja 1000. And it's a very capable bike, but it was never designed for racing like this one. <clears throat> and after a while I ran out of ground clearance uh, when I do track days I always ask for instruction they have a team of uh, instructors there with the track day and they are happy to share with you what they know about the track the lines the how to operate your bike to get the most out of it <clears throat> Well, the guy that was following me around at my request followed me off the track and he says, you're dragging your mufflers. Well, no, but that was the kind of the end of that because the, um, the mufflers were close to the ground, but they didn't hit. They, it has low mufflers. Uh, the uh, Ninja 1000. But that was kind of uh, the wake-up call, I need to get a proper bike. <clears throat> if you do enough track days, you are going to get better. You're going to be a more competent rider. You're going to be a safer rider. And so uh, what I mean by that is you will learn how hard you can put on the brakes, for instance, you would probably be surprised if you went someplace that was safe, the road is clean, there isn't traffic, and just practice. How hard can you ply the brakes? Uh, I, whenever I get a new bike, I go do that. I'll find a, a place and I'll go 35 and I'll squeeze the brakes. And, you know, slam on the brakes, squeeze the brakes. How hard can you do that? 45, 55, 60 or so. And you will find that you can really put on the brakes maybe a lot more than you thought you could. <clears throat> and there probably isn't anything you could learn to do that will save your ass more than being able to maximum brake. You can have the idea that you're going to do something, but when that truck pulls out in front of you, you're not going to analytically think about stuff. You will go back to your training. So you have to train like it means something. <clears throat> anyway, so I picked this up and the uh, standard thing that I do on a, I get the bike home, I take it apart so I can see everything, I clean it thoroughly and during the cleaning process you will find broken parts and things that maybe uh, are a little sketchy now and you fix them. and then you put the bike back together. <clears throat> I repaired a few things on this one. It has some non-stock pieces on it. For instance, this uh, Olin's damper. Don't necessarily have to have that, but when the front wheel is light, sometimes some bikes will go into a tank slapper, and that doesn't always end very well. So I put one on this. And the, the nature of this bike, the geometry is such, when I say geometry, I mean how they designed the swing arm, the distance from the axle to where the swing arm, right here, where that goes. It will lift the front wheel in second gear and it just stays there. It hovers above the ground a few inches
and in, until it comes down the back side of the torque curve, which is somewhere over 100 miles an hour. So at Thunder Hill, uh, I would go to full throttle onto the front straight, and it would just float the front end. And so I would have to have it pointed where I wanted it to go, go to full throttle as I'm finishing climbing back on the bike, and it would just stay in the air. And then finally the front end would come down, and then I would bang third, and then fourth. And I never got it out of fourth there because the top speed you get on a bike is determined by how much straightaway you have. And I was only able to get up to 158 before I started to run out of racetrack, which is kind of another subject is overcoming your fears. Because <clears throat> if you're looking at a 90 degree turn coming and you're going 158, I tell you that that little voice in your head is not suggesting that you're going to die. It's screaming you're going to die. And so you have to overcome that in order to improve. And with enough track days, you'll push a little bit and push a little bit and you'll become a better rider. And uh, sometimes the little voice in your head is right. <laughs> it's there to try to keep you from killing yourself. But the bikes, like this bike, is so much better than I am. I will never find the... Uh, the limit of what this bike can do. Never. Some really excellent riders probably can't get the most out of one of these, but it was designed to be on the racetrack and so it makes, it, I feel like the poor bike is just so bored with what I'm asking it to do. It only does what you ask it to do. And if you ask it to do something stupid, uh, it'll just turn around and spank you because machines that are this high strung are really intolerant of lack of respect. If you don't respect it, you're going to maybe get a helicopter ride. Uh, this particular bike has enough power to burn rubber out of the turn. So if you get throttle happy, it may spin that tire up, turn sideways, and throw you so high you can see your house from there. And that will not end well for most people. This one here has a, a nickname. Many things have had this nickname, but this one here is known as the Widowmaker. Well, how'd it get that name? Well, I got that name from professional racers and amateur racers. They got a little too throttle happy on the corner exit and it just throws them down the street. To work around that, I installed a G2 throttle tamer. So there's an ellipse in here instead of a constant diameter. And so when I roll on the gas, not as much happens all of a sudden and you can control the amount of throttle coming out of the turn much better. I have uh, four of my six bikes have a G2 throttle tamer and uh, it's enough where you could if you want to spin the tire just keep rolling on at some point the tire is going to start letting go and there's an edge right there. If you go too far the back end is going to step out and throw you down the street or you can just hold your hand still, the bike will catch up, and you can go on from there. So uh, I recommend those. It had this Yoshimura system on it when I got it. Made some repairs there. This uh, intermediate pipe was dented. I sent it to expensive lightweight stuff in Arizona, and Pete straightened it and polished it. That's why it looks like new. I uh, polished these wheels. They come all black. And I just love the look of the polished lips, so I did on this, and I, I think you might agree that that is a pretty handsome motorcycle right there with those fancy wheels. I put these uh, grips on the tank. 
help hold on. There's also grip here. These, these are tech spec and you shape them and put them on there. The theory is if you're not holding on too tight you can feel what the front end has tried to tell you. You know there's <laughs> I imagine there's a little voice up there going help me help me I, I can't do it. Well if you can feel that coming you can do something about it but if you have a death grip on those you won't feel it happen and it'll be a big surprise when the front end lets go. So the MotoGP guys and they have a very light grip so they because they are right on the edge all the time anyway so if you can hold on with your knees you don't have to hold on so tight although when you're accelerating hard you have to hold on I I had a, a ZX14 once that tried to leave without me that light grip thing that wasn't working out for me that day because I was going off the back of the bike and I was able to roll off with my fingertips and climb back on so, so there's a point where there's a time to hold on tight and then there's a time to not hold on so tight the ZX14 uh, there are other bikes like the Busa and such as that they the, the phrase stupid fast was made for those bikes because it's just crazy how hard they accelerate and this bike is similar but it's much lighter and uh, even though the magazines back in the day said it'll go a hundred miles an hour in first gear I've never tried that because I don't want to beat on the engine for nothing but there is kind of nowhere on the street where you can run this through the gears because uh, it has an electronic speed limiter, I'm told, that controls it so it won't go over 186 miles an hour because that's safe, of course. It's after that that things get a little shaky. <clears throat> My uh, ZX14 had the same limiter, but it, the guy had added on a, an electronic device that fooled the computer into thinking it was still in fifth gear and it would go ahead and wind out. Because 186 is just not fast enough if you're late for work. These are heli bars. Well, what the heck is that? Heli bars are replacement handlebars where you can get the bars up and back farther uh, I had some prior neck injuries and so my neck does not want to bend backwards and I'm going to show you some photos uh, on the track and you say well you know you could have put your knee down right there and I, well yes you could if I was younger uh, my neck is too damaged to bend all the way backwards like you have to to assume the stink bug position So if you can get your, your knee down and it's a fine gauge and if you and Valentino Rossi can pick the bike back up when you've lost the front end and you're using your knee, well, good for you. I can't get my knee down because my neck won't go backwards. <clears throat> I've had some compression injuries on it. I didn't make it any better by learning to do aerobatics in a pit special. I'll insert a photo here so you can see what that looks like. I got lucky and I did a repair for a guy and he offered to take me flying and that led to learning to do aerobatics. We went up I actually lost track of how many times we went but as a normal part of that you're pulling G's a normal pull up for 
a loop, for instance, or some vertical maneuver is four to four and a half Gs. That puts a lot of load on your body parts. Uh, only time I had more G than that is I, again, I got lucky and I was in the back seat of a P-51 Mustang and he pulled five G's. And I was not ready for that so that pretty much, um, my head went to my chest. All the meat on your body just tries to go south. It just, your, my shoes would get tight. Uh, your face just tries to drip off the bones. There isn't really words to describe what that that is like and that was followed by all the color going away everything was black and white and then the sides were coming in as I was going unconscious and about that time he finished the turn and it all popped right back up. Well I learned how to mitigate that by uh, taking deep breaths and bearing down in my midsection and that's what we do when we were flying the pits is I would take two deep breaths and I would bear down on my midsection to keep the blood from all going into my socks. <laughs> anyway, hard on my neck. I had neck pain after that and the chiropractor said, why are you doing that to yourself? Well, same reason I'd ride a bike like this. Just, it's just a, a lot of motion and it's a lot of fun and I love high performance stuff. So anyway, if you're going to do some track days, I would recommend that you get yourself a bike made for that purpose and put it in excellent condition because you're betting your life on it and get some instruction. And if you just keep going and keep getting instructions, you will actually get really good at it. You'll probably surprise yourself at how good you can ride after that. And on the street, that can save your bacon because people that are new to riding are afraid to make that corner. They will actually choose to crash rather than lean the bike over because they're afraid they'll crash. I know it doesn't sound logical, but when you're in panic mode, you know, you've, you've seen guys do that. They go into a corner, they're afraid to lean over, and they choose to crash to the outside of the turn. Sometimes it's not bad, other times they get hurt. So <clears throat> as you get faster, if you have that surprise in the corner, oops, didn't know this was a decreasing radius turn, you'll just go ahead and roll into it as opposed to what else might happen. I just looked down here. Now you might be looking at the chicken strips on this tire. So I'm going to insert a picture of this same tire when I got back from a track day. The same reason this has some unused stuff there on the edge is the same reason I'm still alive. You have to pick your spot. Easy for me to say because I've had a lifetime of not doing the right thing, but I'm still here. I'm still riding. As I record this, this is uh, January of 2024. In May I'll be 75 years old and I'm still riding. And uh, ride your own bike. And what we mean when we say ride your own bike is if you're not comfortable, don't do it. Those guys that are leaving you in the dust have more experience. They might have better bikes. You could kill yourself trying to keep up or you can choose to get trained and ride better and live to ride another day. It's not that I haven't crashed. I've crashed a bunch of times. I've broken bones. It's just they healed up. So hopefully uh, you will never have that experience, but I can tell you it's, it's not convenient if you live by yourself and you come home and you've broken both your legs, your collarbone, you had 
head impacts till you had vertigo, had broken rib. There was no place to pick me up. Nobody could help me. That's damned inconvenient. And it's something we don't think about when we're being heroes. Is uh, There is stuff on the road you can't do anything about. I don't care how good you are. If you hit some crap in a corner, you're going to crash. I don't care who you are. So, the only thing we can do about that is to slow down just a little bit. And that would have saved me on several pretty good crashes I've had. The last one, I hit the ground going about 60. And ordinarily, that wouldn't have been much of a problem. When you're young, you're made of rubber. But when you're old, the crap just starts breaking. And that's how I end up with both legs fractured, collarbone fractured. It wasn't that bad of a get off. I just lost the front end on a poor paving job that they did. They, they paved over a ramp at the apex, a ramp. And so the front wheel came off the ground and I happened to be trail braking lightly at that moment, but it was just enough that the wheel stopped while it was in the air. So when it came down, there was nothing to say about it. I went straight into the ground face first. It, it's an advertisement for a full face helmet. If I'd had open face helmet, I wouldn't be here because my face went straight into the ground. I watched the road going by. I couldn't pick myself up off of anything. Collarbone is broken, so my left arm was trailing behind me. There's nothing to say about it. And then I hit something and I started flipping. And as I, I got air three times, and during that, process that's when the legs got busted young guys would have probably just got up and dusted themselves off but I did not anyway I love this bike this is the most exciting bike I have the other bikes are fun to ride but this one here is exciting it's you feel every moving part it's not made for comfort at all and everything that's moving imparts a little bit of vibration into the bike. It's uh, very lightweight, very responsive. It has a wonderful exhaust note. Uh, I generally want my bikes to be quiet, but this one here, the exhaust is there for the horsepower. Uh, I had a dynode. has a 156 horsepower at the tire and it has a power commander so it's tuned correctly the uh, the line on the dyno graph is just a straight up from one corner you know it just goes right up it never does anything suddenly it doesn't have a sudden peak of power it just pulls and since it doesn't do anything surprising if you if you get surprised it's your fault it only does what you ask But I would recommend uh, learning to brake as hard as you can brake. Um, do some track days, ask for instruction, and you'll get better and better, and that will make you safer on the street. So that's my little tour of the ZX-10. And uh, you're still with me. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Goodbye.